Welcome to Palm Sunday at Waruna. We acknowledge that we meet on Jarra land, home for many millennia of the Jar Jar Wurrung people. They tended this land, they sang its songs, they danced its stories. Sovereignty over this land has never been ceded and we pay our respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. We meet again, coming together across time and space in a way that is so different to our previous experience and to that of our sisters and brothers over two millennia. We remember that we are part of a church unbounded by time and space, the communion of saints that we speak of in the creed. We are united in fellowship, in worship, in service, and in love. The Waruna congregation here in Bendigo also welcomes those who are not part of our regular gathering, but who in these irregular times find this way of worshipping helpful. Thank you for joining us and for sharing in fellowship and prayer. And thank you for your encouragement. We come to our call to worship and we invite you to join in the responses. Give thanks to God, for God's love remains steadfast and true. Though the future is uncertain and the way is dimmed by threat of violence, we give thanks to God, for God's love remains steadfast and true. Even as hatred barricades the road, our love leads us on, following our Master. And we give thanks to God, for God's love remains steadfast and true. We lay down our lives and lift up our praise for the one who comes in God's name to bring true and abundant love. And we give thanks to God, for God's love remains steadfast and true. We're going to have our, the first of our Bible readings. The first one is from Mark chapter 11 and tells the story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem. Morning. Our first Bible reading this morning comes from Mark chapter 11 verses 1 to 11. I'm reading from the NRSV. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them that Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, and he went out into Bethany with the twelve. 
Our first song is a Palm Sunday song, uh, a butte set of words that have been set to a very traditional tune, Tell the City. Let us pray. Hosanna, blessed Lord, who saves us with love, draw close to us on this day and join us with each other. Remind us that you are with us always, in all moods and seasons, in all our doubts and fears. May we be especially aware of your presence at this time. And after the palm branches have withered, and the songs of praise have died away. May our love for you remain steadfast and true. Let's pause and make our confession before God. When we come to the prayer, we'll use the responses, Lord have mercy and Christ have mercy. We come before God, mindful of our need for God's grace and mercy. When we come to the prayer, we'll use the responses, Lord have mercy and Christ have mercy. Let us pray. On Palm Sunday, the crowds worshipped Jesus. On Good Friday, they shouted for him to die. Let us, who also worship him, confess that we too have had our moments when we have not welcomed him and when we have shared in his rejection. We ask for forgiveness. Lord Jesus Christ, you come to us in peace, but we have not understood what this might mean, and we have shut the door of our mind against you. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You come to us in humility as one who serves, but we prefer our own proud ways. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You come to us as one seeking companions, but we resist uncertain of the claim that you make upon our lives. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, 
Forgive our hollow hosannas. Fill our hearts as we struggle to love. Come to us and make us your home forever. Amen. Christ Jesus came into the world for us and for people like us who also struggle with the challenges of love. Hear then the word of grace and the assurance of pardon. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now we'll hear our second reading, this time the story of the woman who anointed Jesus. And the second reading is Mark chapter 14, verses 3 to 9. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, Why was this ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii, and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you will always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand, before its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. In this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Christ. We are, as is obvious, separated by uh, distances and even by time. We're not all watching it quite at the same time. As we come to Easter, it's good to remember that we are one people, a people who are made special by God's love and God's grace. To help remind us of that, I thought we thought it would be really good if we could uh, all have the opportunity to contribute something to our Easter Sunday worship. So there can be a real special time of celebration. So we thought about it a bit. We came up with the idea of making scenes of celebration. So this is going to call forth a bit of artistic ability, and don't tell me you haven't got any. Everyone can do something. I mean, even if it's a bit of graffiti on a wall, we're all capable of doing that, so long as we don't get caught. Anyway, I uh, played around with my tablet uh, the last couple of days because I'm stuck at home with nothing much to do, and I came up with some, um, some images. This one says, as you can, hope you can all see, Jesus is alive. And this one has got a title on it that says Sunrise. Now, that's an obvious play on words. The sun rises every day, but at Easter we particularly celebrate the fact that Jesus rose and is with us and alive. And here's another one. This one says, or you can read it, He is risen, which is something that we particularly celebrate when we come to Easter. And here I thought I'd have a bit of a crack at an angel. So here's the angel at the empty tomb and he's telling the women that he is not here. Now, I just anticipated what we're going to be saying and thinking about next week. But I want us all to uh, have the opportunity to, to think about these things and to contribute something. So go home. Oh, you are at home. Pull out your coloured pencils, a bit of uh, paper from somewhere, uh, texture colours, 
pastels, any medium is welcome. Some of you might like to take some chalk out and write on the footpath or write on your wall. Not inside, you'll get into trouble. The whole point is that we'd love you all, or as many as you'd love, and people of all ages, let's not just restrict this to the children, let's have everyone a chance to contribute something special to our celebration. And what we'd like you to do is to, um, to take a photo of it. If it's written on the footpath, that's all you'll be able to do anyway. Or you could run it across your scanner. Whatever, send us the image and try and do it within a few days. Maybe, well, I'm just guessing, maybe by Tuesday night, that gives you three days. Uh, send them in and we'll be able to put them together and make a great big celebration of all these scenes that you've contributed. It, it, it doesn't have to be strictly about Easter. It might just be a whole lot of people that you want to put in your picture having fun and celebrating in a way that perhaps we're not quite able to do at the moment. But so enjoy it, have fun, send them in. And if you're not part of our regular, our regular congregation, then we'd love you to participate too. Um, send it in, just add your name and, and where you're from. And that'll give us a, a better idea too of, of where the pictures have come from. So if you could all do that, and the, the, the email address to send them to is uh, waruna, U-C-A, at gmail.com. That's waruna, W-E-E-R-O-O-N-A. But you'll be able to see that from... Um, from YouTube and whatever anyway. Waruna UCA, one word, at gmail.com. And we look forward to getting lots of uh, fabulous pictures. The South Australian uh, author Lee Newton wrote a fabulous song for, I think, for this time of the year. It invites us to enter into the story of Jesus uh, in, in imaginative ways, uh, taking up the viewpoint and parts of different players in the story. It's called, And We Stood Right There.
leave her alone. An action unexpected, a pouring seeming haste, a moment for a spilling of recklessness and waste, a gesture for defying the frugal and the wise, a splash of beauty's perfume bringing tears to the eyes. The jar of alabaster holding ointment thick and sweet, its suffering and death poured over head and feet. With crying and with touching, love's cavernous caresses embraced the teacher's weary heart and wiping with her tresses, in devotion spends herself with carelessness and weeping. The man is strangely grateful and grasps the loving deeply. Things there are so beautiful they can't be bought or traded. With wasteful generosity the visions never faded. And beauty is an odd thing, not understood by all, and loving even stranger for those who miss her call. Some simply fail to comprehend, and good souls take offence. The teacher talks once more of love and speaks to make defence. The poor are always present to test your loving's power. The gift she has created here is precious to this hour. Our time on earth is given. One day we'll all be gone. My burial is waiting now. Let be. Leave her alone. This is one of my favourite stories. And I've perhaps written more poems in response to it than any other gospel story. <clears throat> to be accurate, there are four versions of this story in our four gospels. In Mark and Matthew, the stories are very similar. The anointing takes place at Bethany, at the home of Simon the leper. The woman is not named. In Mark, it is some of the people present who become angry at the waste. In Matthew, it was the disciples. And John tells a similar story, which is unusual because John's gospel is quite different from the other three. But his story also takes place in Bethany. But this time it is at the house of Lazarus, Martha and Mary. And it is Mary who does the anointing. And Judas is named as the person who objects. Luke's story is the different one. It takes place in an unnamed village at the home of Simon the Pharisee. The woman is also not named, but she is described as a woman of the street. The Pharisee objects, but not to the waste, but to the character of the woman who Jesus allows to touch him. Luke's story is also found early in the Gospel, and there is no link made with Jesus' death. Luke's story is about love, gratitude, welcome, and forgiveness. Popular culture tends to conflate these stories, mix them all in. It often makes Mary Magdalene uh, the woman in the story, um, and, of course, she's not mentioned in any of them. I mention this because it is easy to get the stories confused and to confuse the meanings too. Today's story from Mark is about love, gratitude and death. Well, love, gratitude, extravagance and death. As Mark tells the story, we know nothing about the woman. We don't know why she poured out the ointment. 
but we can speculate. It is clearly an act of love. Perhaps Jesus has healed her, or her mother, or her child, or her husband. It is certainly possible. Or perhaps as a woman, she appreciated his welcome, his openness to her, the fact that he took her seriously and valued her conversation, her thoughts. Like in the story of Mary of Bethany, who listened at Jesus' feet. This too is possible. There is much love here. There is much gratitude. And there is death too. It is possible also that the woman may have been one of the company of women who travelled with Jesus, some of whom are named, and who gave financial support to the company. She may have known him well, although we might then ask, if she knew him well, why wasn't she named? We don't know. But perhaps her intuition told her in a way that the men disciples couldn't see, that the time was approaching when Jesus would no longer be with them. Her action then becomes a farewell gift of love. Mark makes it clear that Jesus knew that his ministry was coming to its climax, that death was a probable outcome. In coming to Jerusalem, Jesus is defiant. He refuses to fear death or be bound by it, even as he accepts its inevitability. Here is the man who declares that life should have no limits, who openly challenges death, who will end offer up his body, offer up his life, rather than retreat from his calling. Love and death. It's also a story of extravagance, the, of a woman who wastes a large sum upon her sweet-smelling gesture, on her declaration of love. The woman's extravagance comes as a response to his. Behind the woman's act of reckless generosity, we see that of a man who pours himself out upon the hands, the heads and the feet of all humankind with commitment and devotion. A man who declares that there is no price that he is not prepared to pay for the sake of those whom he loves. And behind that man, we see the divine parent reaching out in love to the world that God has made. Arms spread wide in a divine embrace, entrusting to that world an only son, a son who gives solid shape and form to his parents' love. Truly I tell you, says Jesus, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. This story of extravagant love and death has been told for nearly 2,000 years. We continue to tell it. And those who hear it, we who hear it, are reminded that we too must make our own response. We too are called to be generous, self-sacrificing with our love, as we show our gratitude for the love that has been shown to us as we declare our love for God, as we take up our cross as followers of Jesus 
and pour out our lives in his service. We pour out our lives upon the heads and the feet of the people whom God gives to us, including those poor who are always with us. Our own extravagant and costly love declares that we are followers of Jesus. Love is to be the pattern of our living as we seek that God's purposes for God's world finds expression in us. Love is to be the pattern of our giving as we spend ourselves working to bring about justice and peace for those who are oppressed and dispossessed. It is to be the pattern of our relationships as we seek for others the fullness of God's eternal life. And as we show, as we practice forgiveness and reconciliation, and as we show a generous acceptance of those who are different. Love is to be the pattern of our common life as we come together to laugh, to sing, and to celebrate, and to weep, and to struggle, and to pray. Death, extravagance, gratitude, love. Love which embraces death and is raised to eternal life. God's love, Jesus' love, found and expressed in the lives of all who follow him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, your love, precious and sweet smelling, has been poured over us, splashing into the very corners of our lives. Help us to take that same love, to grow it in our hearts, and to pour it out so that others who also fear, doubt and struggle might also find life. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn, a wonderful hymn that again embraces the story, My Song is Love Unknown.
God invites us to share in the work of transforming the world. We make our offerings in various ways and at various times with the prayer that they will be used to build God's kingdom. Let us pray. Receive our gifts, Lord, many and varied as they are. Let the money that we bring be a token of who we are and what we want for the world. Let our gifts be used to right the wrong, to share the peace, to heal the sick and to to declare the good news. We offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. We come to God with the, our prayers of the people. Let us pray. God, as we make our prayers, we acknowledge that we struggle to know how we should pray. On this Palm Sunday, we pray for the courage to travel with you to Jerusalem and to all the other places of trouble and despair. On this Passion Sunday, we pray that we will not be found wanting when we come to the times of challenge and confrontation. In this unique time of crisis, we pray for calm minds and patience as we consider the needs of others, especially those who are vulnerable. We remember those who face uncertainty and loss, workers whose jobs and income are at risk, employers concerned for the welfare of those they employ, people whose businesses have collapsed, and those whose enterprises may yet fail, people concerned for their children, people concerned for their parents and others for whom they especially care. We pray for those whose vocations require them to be at risk as they meet with customers and especially for health and aged care workers as they continue to tend to the elderly and the ill. We pray for government for officials, for public servants and administrators as they fulfil their responsibilities, providing oversight and direction during this time of crisis. And we pray for ourselves. Help us to live as your people, to live out our calling as disciples, to encourage, to affirm, to bless and to love, like the one who we follow. God, we bring you our particular concerns for ourselves and for others. God, as we make our prayers, we acknowledge that we struggle to know how we should pray. And so we use the words that you gave your followers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Growing up in the 60s, 
we would make a sign of peace like that. I didn't realise it at the time, but it is very similar to Jesus' gesture of blessing so often found in Christian iconography. I'm going to offer you a greeting of peace from a distance. You might like to do the same, using an appropriate gesture with the people with whom you are watching or using our imaginations with the people that we can't see, who are also our sisters and brothers and whom we know are watching with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And now we're going to sing a uh, modern set of words to a very old tune. The uh, hymn is called Ride On, Ride On. These words that we sing come to us from the community of Iona. The way has begun. This time next week, the world will be different. But the journey, difficult and filled with pain, still has to be travelled. Go now in the shadow of the promise, with the God who has already travelled and will travel again the same path in the name of love. This week will shock and disturb as the heart is torn out of the universe. But the promise is that it will beat again. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace.